Welcome to Jammin' with Jason Mefford, a show where we discuss topics relevant to chief audit executives and professionals in audit, risk, and compliance. We discuss the technical and soft skills needed to navigate the minefields of organizations. You hear best practices and practical advice for helping you advance your career, and we'll even talk about music, mindfulness, and psychology, because we can. So sit back and relax while you listen to the number one podcast in the world for internal auditors, unscripted and unedited. Welcome to another episode of Jamming with Jason. Hey, today I am excited to have Gleb Sapersky with me, who is an expert kind of in decision making, and this is going to be really relevant for all of you in internal audit, especially as you are looking at risk management and some of the decisions that we end up kind of screwing up sometimes, <laughs> okay? So Gleb, welcome on. I'm excited to have you here. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, and thanks for having me on, Jason. It's a pleasure. Yeah, we often screw up risk management, <laughs> and it's it's a big issue. I was actually talking to a pro, to a professor who I was corresponding with, and he sent me a paper of his that found in a ten year study that CFOs tend to be way too confident about their risk portfolios, yeah. and you know they really make bad bets on the stock market investments because they tend to be too confident. So that's one thing we can talk about. But that was just something that came up. Yeah, today. no, it's, it, it's, I mean, that's a great point because, you know, I see this, I see this a lot. I mean, I used to be chief audit executive a couple times, mm. was also chief risk officer. Okay, so, so I've kind of seen both sides of this and I, and I see exactly what you're saying, right? Mm. Is that we, we tend to get overconfident in our ability to manage these things you know, because it's like, it's like I, I sometimes I kind of use the, the analogy of, of driving, right? Mm. And and I'm an excellent driver. I'm an excellent driver, <laughs> right? For Rain Man, <laughs> and saying like, because I'm an excellent driver, I won't get in an accident, mm. right? And it's like, okay, there's statistics, right? Yes, even though you're a safe driver, there's still statistics that that do kind of, you know, come over everything. So. So I wanted to talk to you because I know you just had a new book that came out, Never Go With Your Gut, mm -hmm. How Pioneering Business Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Failures. So maybe that's just- right. That's right there. It's the one right there on, on the yeah. shelf, right? Yeah. That's right. So, so maybe just give, give everybody just kind of a brief overview of the book. Mm -hmm. And then let's kind of jump in and talk about, you know, how we can make better decisions avoid some of these business failures or bad decisions when it comes to, you know, risk and even, <coughs> excuse me, how we kind of, you know, convert that over into the internal audit space, because there's a lot of crossover and carryover here. So tell us a little bit about the book. Sure. Happy to. Well, the first thing is to understand is the title. Many people tell us to go with your gut. And that is typical that people go with their intuition. They feel comfortable growing, going with it. But that's very wrong, according to recent research in cognitive neuroscience. For example, just like I mentioned, the CFOs who tend to be way too confident about their estimates of the finances, the stock market. And there's quite a bit of research showing that people who are too confident their companies, they are too aggressive, their companies have bad performance as a result, and their finances have bad performance. So, and another th funny thing I have to mention about the, the driving. So there was an interesting study done, a number of studies that showed similar results. When you ask undergraduates, how many, you know, are you a good driver or a bad driver or are you an average driver? 93% yeah. uh, of undergraduates say that they're a good driver. They're above average. 93? 93? 93% of undergraduates say they're a good driver, that they're above average driver. So what does that mean? You know, they, have, they don't have nearly as much experience as you and I, but that's yeah. kind of what people think. That's just a measure <laughs> of overconfidence, right? Well, no, so, I, I, yeah, because yeah, I'd heard another study about IQs, because I've mm -hmm. used this in some of the trainings that I've done, you know, same kind of thing where you know, imagine if you were in a room of a thousand people, you went around, ask everybody, are you above or below yeah. average IQ? And I think the number that the studies came up with, it was, it was over 80%. Again, maybe it wasn't quite as high as 93%, but mm -hmm. 
but you know, that's, that's one of those where you've got to go, okay, just a minute, time out people, right? You can't, you can't just go with your gut. You got to start having some data and what does average actually mean? 50% mm -hmm. above 50% below. Right? So when you start going through and, and understanding that, um, you can see that, well, yeah, we probably are overconfident, much more overconfident yes. than we should be. And it doesn't mean that we're horrible or anything <laughs> like that, right? <laughs> you know, but, but the fact is, it's, it's okay to be average. I mean, if you look at statistics, what, 68% is one standard deviation. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, so overconfidence, over, right? Over, overconfidence, right? This, is, this is a big issue. So how, how do yeah. we... So overconfidence, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the book and then get into overconfidence, but I just want to okay. mention about what you're saying. It's not only simply undergraduates and people who is estimate their IQs. It's also people who are service professionals, high qualified service professionals like internal auditors. Mm -hmm. You know, there are studies. I don't remember a study of internal auditors, but I remember studies of pretty similar people. So university professors in terms of education and anal analytical perspectives on lawyers. Mm -hmm. If you ask university professors, you know, how good is your teaching? Do you think are you above average, below average or average? you'll get about 90% of university professors say they're above average. And lawyers about their professional credential, their professional ability, they'll say about 80% will say that they're above average. So that's the, those are some other examples where we tend to be too confident about our professional abilities. And of course, the same thing happens with CFOs that I mentioned earlier in the study and earlier in the interview that, and that results in really bad performance when you're mm -hmm. overconfident about your ability. So the book talks about the kind of dangerous judgment errors we make because of how our brain is wired. We don't really notice them. We feel comfortable with something and because we feel comfortable with it, we go with it. We think mm -hmm. that this is the right thing to do. That's a fundamental, fundamental, fundamental error. Just because we feel confident with something, we feel good about it, we think it's the right thing to do. And we need to distance ourselves from this feeling of the right thing, meaning that and believing that this feeling means it is actually the right thing. We need to distance ourselves from feeling that we trust certain information and then believing that that information is accurate. The feeling of trust is just a feeling. It doesn't necessarily indicate that the information is accurate. This, is, this comes, this feeling comes from our gut intuitions. And our gut intuitions, you might be surprised, are actually not adapted for the modern business environment. <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> no. They've, I mean, the modern business environment has been around only since World War II. Our gut intuitions are actually adapted for the savanna environment when we were hunters, foragers, and gatherers. Yeah. We lived in small tribes of you know, 15 to 150 people. So that's one of the fundamental things that causes us to make bad decisions is our tribal instincts. Mm -hmm. We like people who look like us, who think like us, who do things like us. So when we perform, you know, when internal auditors perform audits, they tend to uh, give people who look like them, who think like them, and so on, they tend to not audit them as well as they should. They tend to give them too much of a pass. And that's kind of one issue for internal auditors. Another thing is with tribalism is climbing the social hierarchy. So we are very tempted to go to the top of the social hierarchy because that's what survival meant. It meant that if we're at the top of the social hierarchy, we get the most resources, we're likely to survive. So that's kind of the tribalism. The other issue is the fight or flight response. It was very good for our ancestors to jump at a hundred shadows, mm -hmm. and miss one saber-toothed tiger. You also hear it called the saber-toothed tiger response. In our current business environment, we don't have nearly as many saber-toothed tigers. No, we don't. <laughs> well, it, dep it depends on who 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 the executive is that you're talking to. Sure, they could sure. be a saber-toothed tiger, could. right? They could, but the, they're not threats to your life. And honestly. What we tend to over respond to threats in our business environment, in our professional re environment, we respond too much too aggressively, jump too fast, too soon, make decisions way too quickly, and we don't take the time to think them through. So that's kind of two big fundamental aspects that cause us to make dangerous judgment errors that cognitive neuroscientists and behavioral economists like myself call cognitive biases. So okay. you've probably heard the term cognitive biases somewhere yep. in the air, and that's what cognitive biases are. They result from our evolutionary heritage, they result from the wiring in our brain that causes us to process information slower than it would be ideal for us to process it in very in problematic ways. And the book talks about the 30 most dangerous cognitive errors, cognitive biases for business leaders and for business professionals like internal auditors. 
and then talks about how we can address them effectively. So it gives techniques that you can use to address them. You can both assess the last chapter of the book as an assessment that you can use to assess where they might show up in your team, in your organization, in your own work. And then <laughs> what kind of techniques you can use to address these cognitive biases effectively in your job. And so that's what the book's about. Sweet. Well, yeah, I know it's, um, you know, it's interesting because I've, uh, besides being in the business world, psychology is like one of my side passions. So I've been studying psychology and things like cognitive bias and, mm. and, and some of these things that you were talking about, just kind of the neuroscience behind the brain. Yep. Uh, and I'm trying to bring that more to this very analytical uh, area of audit, right? Mm -hmm. And again, like you said, I mean, evolutionary wise, you can understand why as humans, we operate the way we do. I mean, it's it's evolutionary biology, right? Because yes. like you said, it wasn't too long ago that we were having to, you know, run from saber tooth tigers, if you will, right? Um, but, but the current, you know, business environment doesn't doesn't require that usually. Um, and there's a whole other stuff around stress that <laughs> we won't go down that road, but that's why, why people feel so stressed out today yes. as well. But, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. Cause like you said, what we talked about already is some of this overconfidence, yes, the tribalism and this fight or flight that, that are some of the things behind maybe why we're making some of these bad decisions. And, and, you know, like you said at the beginning, I mean, everybody says, go with your gut. Heck, I tell people to go with your gut or your heart on certain things, right? Because again, when it's when it's personal in nature, when mm. you're the one that's impacted, go with your heart, baby. You know, it's it's like it's not that big a deal. But if you're the CFO mm. uh, or the chief audit executive of a big company, and you make a bad decision, <laughs> that can lead to like like the title of your book, you know, business failures, which can end up impacting literally millions of people yes. and and you know you, you can see in the newspaper all the time i mean any 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 given week <laughs> you can see an executive who's totally screwed something up absolutely and I mean, and it, it it impacts lots of people yep it does it does i mean look at what happened with we work a company that was valued in the beginning of 2019 at 75 billion and it went forward with the ipo despite some internal folks at WeWork, including internal risk auditors, encouraging or well, discouraging the leadership from doing that. I mean, they really didn't do as much as they should when we look back at what happened in the situation. Now, when the in external <laughs> risk auditors were investigating the situation, they saw that there was a great deal of self-dealing going on and mm -hmm. very bad governance structures where Adam Newman, the leader, the founder of WeWork, pushed for the IPO was actually owning some properties, lending them to WeWork. He had um, other screw-ups in the governance structure. He had shares that he owned that were worth 10 votes per share, and he was selling sh shares that were worth one vote per share, and a number of other issues with the governance structure that really should have been taken care of by internal risk auditors, which wasn't taken care of before the IPO. And as a result, right now, if the company, by the end of 2019, the company was worth about $7 billion. <laughs> well, yeah, because I noticed, I think it was, uh, you know, last week, you know, when I saw the $100 billion poof, you know, on Wall Street, and it was WeWork and it was Uber. Yep. That, you know, the valuations of both of those companies were downgraded so far that $100, $100 billion yes. worth of market cap just went poof right? That's a hundred billion dollars worth of wealth that just went away because of some bad decisions that people made, right? Exactly. And uh, with WeWork, of course, it was the to go to the IPO, the 70 billion. With uh, Uber, the problem, again, that internal risk auditors should have caught was the culture of sexual harassment that wasn't really addressed when it needed to be addressed. Yep. That resulted in really bad situation with the Uber CEO um, having to leave because he was implicated in not addressing this culture. Right. So this should have been addressed. And this was, th these are just a couple of the problems that come from tribalism. And here, what I want to talk about, especially with regard to internal auditors is tribalism. This is the big problem. So I give a number of presentations to ISACA, the Information Security and 
of association which has a number of internal auditors mm -hmm. and what they and when i talk to them one of the biggest challenges is that they experience that is that when they perform audits they find that there are people issues a lot of people issues like we talked about with Adam Newman at WeWork and this culture of sexual harassment at Uber that resulted in the hundred billion dollar poof. But they don't really know how to address people issues. They don't really, they're not really trained in addressing people issues. So they focus on the process issues, on technical issues, technology, even though people are behind the technology. So for example, they focus on, let's say this we integrated the new technology, people aren't using it. Well, maybe it's the fault of the technology, whereas really it's a change management issue where the people who are should be using this technology are not using the technology. As a result, there's increased risk, which the technology was supposed to address. And that's a kind of a typical case study that I hear when I do ISACA presentations that I talk to folks about. Yeah, because it is. I mean, underlying a lot of the issues, um... You know, which, which is interesting because again, you know, internal auditors, we pride ourselves on, on testing internal controls and processes, but implicit in that is that people are part of the process mm -hmm. and we tend to forget that quite often. And like you said, I, I think sometimes it's because, you know, a process is easy to, to, to kind of say binarily, right? It's, it worked or it didn't work. So it's really easy for an auditor at that point to say, you know, it, it worked or it didn't work. And it's a clear and easy, easy thing to kind of put out there. Um, you know, and like you said, though, that these people issues, and this has led a lot of people to try to audit culture and some other things, which I've got my own feelings on that, but um, <laughs> for, for a different podcast. But, but like you said, that, that we, we get to this point to where, um, you know, there, there is some of these people issues and a lot of, a lot of people turn a blind eye to some of the tribalism issues, right? Um, you know, and I'm old enough to remember a lot of the big failures that we've had, right? And, and in fact, we, we'll just go back to 2008. Mm. Um, I know a lot of people who are partners at public accounting firms that turned a blind eye. I know a lot of people yep. that were internal audit CFOs at mortgage companies that turned a blind eye. I know a lot of people that were executives at banks that turned a blind eye and it, it's it's those kind of things you know where again this tribalism like you're talking about comes in because we don't want to be the one that kind of rocks the boat absolutely or, or, or says something and it's not just 2008 i mean i can go back and there's lots of other different things yeah, so I mean, look at look at arthur anderson in 2002 That's i worked at arthur anderson baby. oh there you go okay <laughs> yeah. no, i watched it from, that. i watched it from the inside because i knew i knew lots of people on the enron engagement Yep, sorry uh, to hear that, but yeah, Arthur Anderson as a company collapsed because of it, because of this kind of blind eye and not really doing what they should have with internal risk audit. Yeah, and it goes, you know, within Enron itself, you know, yeah, as, so. as a result of, of what they were doing. And again, everybody kind of going along to get along. And some of the people at Anderson were guilty of the same thing. Right. Of course. Yeah. Um, so, so, so how do we internal? Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so how do we actually deal with, with some of this stuff? Cause again, I mean, I want to try to give mm -hmm. the listener some practical stuff, of course. right? So, so how do we, you know, cause again, like you said, if we're, if we're trying to make decisions and something like tri this tribalism comes in, how do we kind of overcome that? What are some things that mm -hmm. we can do to try to help us, make better decisions so we don't allow these cognitive biases to get in the way and then we make a decision that later on we regret the first thing i'm going to say is a word that will scare many internal auditors is emotions emotions <laughs> yes it shouldn't if they've been listening to me for very long <laughs> but yeah i mean a lot of internal auditors are uncomfortable with it, with that word but yeah. when we look at the research in cognitive neuroscience Emotions shape about 80 to 90 percent of our decision making. So 80 to 90 percent of our decisions are shaped by emotions. No matter how rational and analytical you think you are, emotions are still driving you fundamentally. And if you're not noticing them, if you're not noticing how emotions are driving you, then you're in deep trouble. So the first thing to understand is how emotions are driving you to make certain decisions. 
we don't, the people in Arthur, Arthur Anderson, as you know, Jason, they weren't deliberately, they didn't wake up one day and say, hmm, let's screw our company by giving Enron a free pass. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's you not, know, let's, let's put 120,000 people out of the job. Right? Yes. That's, that's not what they were saying. That's not what they were saying. They just felt a certain way and they acted and they didn't even notice these feelings, which were guiding them away from a proper audit of Enron. And the same thing in 2008 and the same thing with uh, added with uh, Uber, the same thing with WeWork and so many other companies. The feel if the feelings are not noticed, then you're not going to get anywhere. So the first thing to do and the book talks about techniques to do that is to learn to notice your feelings that cause you to steer your audit in the wrong direction that cause mm -hmm. you to miss certain things. The, and these are feelings of uncomfort of discomfort. Again, what, so, uh, like I said from the beginning, we feel a certain way, we feel comfortable with a certain decision, with a certain direction in the audit, and we go with it. And that's a very bad choice. When you feel comfortable with something, that's the first step to suspect. Okay, suspect that there might be something off if you feel comfortable with a certain direction. Because you will likely miss important information that's often people related. <laughs> Because you, you would, your gut intuitions are directing you away from dangerous, from what you feel is a dangerous area relating to people. So that's the first step. Noticing well, your and, and I'm glad that you said that. And, and you, you said the 80 to 90% too, because that's what I've been trying to preach to people. Um, because again, in kind of the analytical side from an, from an audit perspective, we think everything is supposed to be logical, hmm. but it's not. And so even, you know, again, from from them trying to help influence within the organization or get people to make decisions, they have to realize those, not only are we making decisions based on emotions, but other people are as well, yeah. right? So you can't just go into something with a logical argument and believe that you're gonna come out victorious in that. You have, you have to get back to actually thinking about the emotional side of it, so, okay. Yeah. That's so that's the first excellent. one, emotions is the that's first one. Yeah, so first one, notice your emotions, make sure that they're not steering you in the wrong direction. And the second one is to focus on the emotions of others. So you slowly start talking about this, Jason, and this is a big issue. I was talking to someone from a bank, a banker, an auditor, who was the chief risk officer of a bank, uh, who was laid off, unfortunately, because he came in to meetings and he pointed out some serious issues, some serious risk that the bank was taking on that it shouldn't have. And he was going against the sales team at the bank and the sales team are saying, no, let's make these loans. Let's make these loans. And he was saying, no, that's dangerous. Don't do that. Don't do that. And eventually the leadership sided with the sales team partially because of the tone that he was employing and that they saw him as going against the profitability of the bank. So he didn't know how to co effectively communicate his, his risk assessment to the leadership in such a way that the leadership would buy into his risk assessment. What he should have done is thought about the emotions of everyone first, because again, they're driven by emotions, just like you are, everyone else is. So what are the emotions of the leadership? The leadership, of course, wants to make a profit. So the CEO wanted to make a profit. That's kind of the main point. The salesperson wanted to make a sale. That doesn't mean profit. They wanted to make a sale. So what you need to think about is, okay, the salesperson wants to make a sale. They'll be pushing for a sale at pretty much any cause. So that's, that's them. The CEO wants to make sure the company is profitable. Now, how does the CEO make sure the company is profitable? One way is to, of course, increase sales, but that will increase risk if you make sell to the wrong people, right? That for the banks, that's a bad idea. So what you need to do uh, is to think about their emotions and appeal to their emotions. Say, hey, our goals are the same. You know, talk to the CEO, or talk to the CFO, talk to the operations people. Our goals are the same. We want to make sure that the bank is profitable. Don't come in and say and be Mr. No. <laughs> you know, don't be Mr. Don't. No, that's not the right approach. You want to be Mr. Profit. You want to say, how do we ensure profitability in the long run? You know, here are the kind of risks we take on from this sale. This sale will likely result in so much profit and so much loss, depending on the risk. You know, if the risk, if the profit is, 
uh, let's say, 5 million from a certain sale, but you have a loss risk, or you have a risk, 50% risk of losing 20 million, mm -hmm. then you have a, effectively a 5 million loss. So you want to point that out. Here's the risk, here's the loss, and you can choose to make the investment, but you have a very high chance of losing within five years, you know, the terms of the loan, you have a very high chance of losing 5 million. That's pretty bad. So how do we make sure that we have profit? So get yourself on the same side, get yourself on the same tribe, because what this guy did is essentially put himself into the opposite tribe. And they just had a lot of fights and conflicts. You wanna get yourself on the same side, wanna make sure that you <coughs> help people orient toward the long term and just show the mathematical consequences of the risk. If again, it, if it's a 50% low percent of risk of losing to of losing 20 million, that's a $10 million loss versus the 5 million profit. That's pretty simple. So what you want to do is just show the profit, show the long-term consequences of certain steps and help the leadership make the right choice by orienting, by being on their side, appealing to their emotions, going to where they want to go. And that's the effective strategy of how do you communicate as the internal auditor, how do you communicate to the leadership? Make them, help them buy into what you want to achieve by talking their language. Talk the language of profit. Don't talk the language of risk. Yeah, well, and I, I like that. Um, I like that, the language of profit. Because, you know, the, the, the experience or that, that example that you just gave of that chief risk officer, I see that quite often <laughs> in internal audit. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, they're, they're well-meaning. They, they, they see the risk because like you said, you know, they can look at the numbers and they see it and they realize, you know, okay, I understand that you, you know, want to do this, but the numbers just don't make sense. Right. And so they're trying to warn, they're, mm -hmm. they're trying to um, help the organization, but the way in which they do it ends up alienating themselves from everybody else. Yeah. And like you said, you know, that, that, that eventually they looked at that chief risk officer as, as somebody who was trying to hurt the organization or look, you're, you're not trying to help us get profit here. You're just telling us, no, we can't do this. Yeah. And it's human nature. If, if you're around somebody that tells you no all the time and you've got the decision-making authority, you're going to kick that person out, <laughs> out of the tribe, if you yep. will. Right. Yep. This is where that tribalism comes back in. So, you know, like you said, I love how, you know, instead of talking in the language of risk, talk in the language of, of profit, you know, help them understand kind of that risk reward mm -hmm. uh, trade-off because yes. with every risk we take, there should be a reward mm -hmm. and the reward should be higher, but the problem comes in and, and kind of economically and, you know, with the way the numbers work, at some point you cross the line. Yes. To where the more risk you take on, yeah, you're hoping for more reward, but the less likely it is to come along, right? Mm -hmm. When you when you start getting above a 50% probability of a major loss, like you said in that instance, right? You know, to where you were you were effectively looking at a five million dollar mathematical loss mm -hmm. if you went down that road. Now, in the first year or two, it might not be, but then you give it back at the end. And that's the issue that I think so many people, uh, you know, for, forget, or this overconfidence comes in is we're going to make it work in the first couple of years. The problem is you give it back yep. and, and you see this over and over again in companies making decisions in the short term that they think are good, but in the long term, it hurts the organization. They give it back. That's right. And I like the, how you phrase it, give it back. It's a good way of approaching it. And the long term is the critical thing here. The long term is the really important thing. So one of the cognitive biases that I talk about in the book, very dangerous, is called hyperbolic discounting, where people discount the long term for the sake of the short term. They don't think about the long term nearly enough. They don't wait nearly enough. And as a chief risk officer, it's your goal, it's your job to help them understand the actual risk over the whole course of the deal. If it's a five-year loan, then you look at the five years and now you don't just look at the first two years and look at the risk over the five years. And of course, that so you help them look at the profit, 
and you, you get on their side, the other thing you want to think about is help them solve the problem. Be the problem solver, not the problem poser. Don't say, here's the problem, you deal with it. They, CEOs hate that, leaders hate that, the CFOs <laughs> hate that. Don't do that. Say, hey, I discovered that here is an opportunity for improvement. How can we work together as a whole tribe of the leadership team to solve this problem and improve the situation in such a way that we can minimize the risk, maximize the reward? If you frame it that way, executives love jumping at a problem and problem solving where to improve the situation. That's that. I mean, that's their bread and butter. <laughs> they'll get into the weeds. They'll kind of look at it and you provided them with the opportunity to do that. They will like you <laughs> because mm -hmm. you provided them with the opportunity. So think about liking and disliking. Help them like you by providing them with the opportunity to minimize risk, maximize reward and make decisions based on that. Yeah. Well, no, and I think that's a, that's a great um... That's a great thing, again, for the internal auditors to consider, because I think so much of the time, and this is where I, I talk about becoming a trusted advisor mm -hmm. to yes. management. And, and I think too much of the time we, we focus on bringing the problems mm -hmm. to management and never either help provide a solution or allow a way to help a solution come out of that. Um, and, and, and there's a lot of deeper things in the profession about, you know, I can't really help because I have to be independent, blah, 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 which is a load of crap in a lot of ways. Okay. Is it's like, you got, you're all, you're all on the same team, you know, yeah. because, because, uh, if, if, if the company ends up having a business failure, you're out of a job, just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. And ultimately your paycheck is paid by the company. So mm -hmm. you might as well be a part of the team instead of being, viewed as that person that nobody wants to talk to <laughs> and is kind of, yes. you know, just shoved off to the side, mm -hmm. um, you know, help them solve the problems, help them think long-term, you know, and, and, and we can provide that, that different perspective. Right. And, and I think this is one of those things too, where, you know, like you said, this, the tribalism can be a problem yes. because it's group think, right. Mm -hmm. Tribalism is group think. And so you have to have some of these, you know, contrary views. Mm -hmm. And again, we don't want to just be the contrarian all the time, because again, then we just look like a jerk. But, you know, some of those other points have to be brought up. But, you, but like yes. you said, you have to think about how you're going to do that and think about it from an emotional perspective as well. Um, and, and you can't go into it saying, you know, I know better than you. <laughs> yes. That's never going to work well with an executive. No, no. <laughs> never. 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 And this is about kind of the social hierarchy. The CEO is above you in the social hierarchy, and that's okay. You want to understand that he or she most likely he wants to feel like the you know like the alpha monkey uh, mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of the, the alpha male in the tribe or the alpha female and you want to help them feel that way, help them feel that they're in charge and they will solve the problem. You bring the problem to them, not like, you know, this is the, dump it in their lap, like you said, Jason, just say, here, how can we address the situation to improve it? And it, this is not about being independent of the team. You never want to do that. You want to look at things objectively yourself, but then separate that objective look at the thing at the situation by yourself from how you bring it to the team. You can still be independent, you can still be objective, but you want to be part of the team when you're resolving the problem because in the end, it's all for the goal of the organization succeeding. Yeah, well, and, and as you were saying that, it actually kind of reminded me because I was, I was actually just recording some other information um, and, and was talking about the old book, How to Win Friends and Influence People mm. by Dale okay. Carnegie. And, and one of the points that he brings up in there is he said, you know, let the other person feel like it's their decision yes. or that it's their idea. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you want to, you know, make friends, you know, may, might be kind of a weird term now, but have a, have a good relationship with other mm -hmm. people and help be able to influence. Be part of the team. Be part of the team. Hey, you know what? We don't have to take the credit for it. Let other people believe that it's their idea or that they mm -hmm. came to it on their own that's going to go over much better as far as being a part of the team. Because again, like you said, not only do we need to help them think about the long term, but I think we need to stand back too and say, what's the right decision for the long term 
in this relationship. Yes. You know, within the company as well. And it's okay to lose the battles if you win the war. <laughs> and so, you know, <laughs> Like I said, you know, that that example you gave about the chief risk officer, I've seen so many chief audit executives that want to that want to win every battle and know, damn it, I'm right. <laughs> and they keep fighting and fighting and fighting. And then they feel almost um, sometimes it can cross over to, to feeling almost self-righteous right. in that, you know, look, I told them and I, you know, blah, 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 kind of thing. And it's like, no, you 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 didn't help. Because mm -hmm. you can only help if you're a part of the team. If you get kicked I, out of the team, you can't help anymore. Yep, I think that's very insightful, kind of the feeling of righteousness. I mean, look at all the people who are debating with others on the internet. How mm -hmm. often does that change people's minds? That debating with others on the internet, it doesn't change people's minds. No. And it really all doesn't change people's minds. It just creates more aggression, more defensiveness if you try to argue and win every fight. I, well, instead of that, if you problem solve and collaborate and you present yourself as a problem solver, collaborator, improver in charge that rather than, you know, the Mr. No, that's going to get you much further, like Jason said. So that's the well, that's what I talk about in the book. How do you effectively do that? What kind of specific techniques and strategies, specific choices in your language, specific choices in your body tone? How do you carry yourself in such a way that you can avoid these cognitive biases for yourself and help your organization avoid them as well. Well, I know we didn't, we just scratched the surface of the book. So for everybody that's, that's okay. listening, go out and get the book. Never go with your gut. How to pi how pioneering business leaders make the best decisions and avoid business failures. Um, Cause yeah, I'm excited to dig deeper into this now too. And, and uh, you've, you've helped kind of confirm a lot of the stuff that I've been saying and studies that I've been reading as well. Mm. And I know when I say some of the stuff, people are probably like, Jason, you're crazy. <laughs> I was like, no, Gleb's an academic. I mean, he, he knows, right? It's not just me that, that a lot of these things are, are going on as, mm -hmm. as they are. So we kind of run out of time today. We might have to do something else in the future because like I said, we just, we just scratched the surface. So, um, let me make sure that I got this right too. So if people want to reach out to you, because I know you do, you do in-house training, you actually yes. go into companies, um, mm -hmm. you mentioned ISACA, you're out on the association um, network as well. So giving, you know, speeches all day, seminar kind of stuff for them. Mm -hmm. um, how can people reach out to you, you know, as well, if they're interested and they're like, Hey, I want to learn more. How can they, how can they find you as the best way to find you? Well, besides, of course, checking out my book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters, you just go on my website, disasteravoidanceexperts.com. Again, disasteravoidanceexperts.com. And there is a section there for speaking. I speak to associations all the time. I speak for internal companies all the time, do trainings inside companies. And you can see the consulting and coaching section. The consulting will be most relevant for internal auditors. So how do I look at an organization and help the internal auditor team play nicely with the <laughs> leadership <laughs> and make better decisions, right? Yes. Cause the, the better decisions you make, the more successful you're going to be. Yeah. Including decisions about these people issues and how do you address people issues both internally, you know, when you're not talking to the CEO, how do you address a challenging people issue when people are not willing to comply with appropriate risk standards? You know, cybersecurity issues is one of the biggest ones I deal with. And of course, then how do you talk to the leadership in such a way that the leadership will actually listen to you as opposed to ignore your opinion <laughs> and take their own actions? So how do you Perfect. do that? So that's what I focus on. You can always reach out to me <coughs> if you have any questions about anything I said at my email, gleb, G-L-E-B, at disasteravoidanceexperts.com. Again, gleb at disasteravoidanceexperts.com. And connect with me on LinkedIn. Happy to chat to people there. Again, Gleb Sipurski is my name. It's going to be Dr. Gleb Sipurski on LinkedIn. So G-L-E-B-T-S-I-P-U-R-S-K-Y. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, Gleb underscore Sipurski. All right, perfect. And we'll make sure and include all that stuff in the show notes as well. So I know if I'm a visual person, so I, I need to see stuff. <laughs> so I it'll be down in the show notes as well, but uh, reach out. Uh, Gleb knows his stuff, as you can tell so far. And uh, like I said, we'll have to get in a little bit deeper probably in the future 
uh so on a future episode or webinar or something we'll have to have you back so happy to jason thanks again for your time today and uh thanks everybody for listening and i'll catch you on the next episode of jamming with jason and that's a wrap thanks for listening to today's episode of jamming with jason keep on rocking in the audit world have a great rest of your day and I'll catch you later on the next show. If you'd like to earn continuing professional education for listening to today's episode, head on over to C-Risk Academy at ondemand.criskacademy.com. And that's C as in the letter C, riskacademy.com. Not only do you get a CPE certificate, but you also will have access to the video version of today's show. The views and opinions expressed on this show are that of the individuals and not of their respective organizations.